Tonight's talk is titled Contraception and the State of Life. This is the second talk in our Humanae Vitae lecture series. So this lecture series started off based on the encyclical by Pope Paul VI on human life, uh, in which he definitively stated that uh, the church is against contraception. And this is the second talk. Our first talk uh, featured Professor Tim O'Malley from the McGrath Institute. And he really laid out for us kind of this comprehensive, holistic vision of what it means to love someone and what it means to love them as a person and love them in accordance with God. And he laid out so what it means to love someone as a person, what it means to be a person and love someone as an embodied creature. Tonight's talk is to illustrate how that can be ruptured, both biologically and uh, morally. Next week, we'll be featuring uh, Susie Younger and Father Terry to talk about the morality and the biology of natural family planning. And then two weeks after that, we'll have Abigail Favali talking about how widespread contraception usage has lots of philosophical problems that lead to other downstream issues, such as uh, gender confusion. Moment. So tonight's speakers, uh, we will first start with Dr. Justin Lugers. Dr. Lugers graduated from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, and he completed his residency at St. Joseph Health System. Dr. Lugers is board certified in family medicine, and his medical interests are natural family planning, care for the underserved, obstetrics, inpatient and outpatient care. So you'll be speaking towards the biological aspects of contraception. Our second speaker would be Professor David O'Connor, who is a faculty member in the departments of philosophy and classics here at Notre Dame. His teaching and writing focuses on ancient philosophy, aesthetics, ethics and politics, and the philosophy of religion. Dr. O'Connor is an acclaimed teacher and lecturer. His online lectures on love and sexuality have reached a wide international audience and are the basis of his two recent books, the first being Love is Barefoot Philosophy, published in 2014, and Plato's Bedroom, Ancient Wisdom and Modern Love in 2015. Also, at the end of this event, we'll be selling tickets for the Right to Life Formal, which will be happening at the end of your loved week, which is in three weeks. So please stick around if you'd like to buy a ticket. If you don't get it now, we'll also be selling tickets at our next event, um, Natural Family Planning with Dr. Susie Younger. Or not Dr. Mrs. Susie Younger. Um, all right. Uh, give it up for Dr. Lewis. Hi, guys. All right. So... Which ones is just this to forward oh, and then point? Okay. Hear me okay? Everybody? Okay. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, I, I got uh, invited by uh, Susie Younger, who's a colleague of mine at St. Joseph. Um, I am a family doc, as Sean mentioned. Um, I uh, joined St. Joseph Health System because of its, uh, because of its ethics and its values. I work at a safety net clinic, um, and I really love what I do. Um, I don't get to do a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of teaching to big groups, so my apologies for for you know the jumpiness of this. I made most of the drawings, so they're kind of terrible too. Um, uh, I just didn't want to copyright too much. Okay, so um, <laughs> uh, uh, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I you know I grew up. I was a died in the wool, like, you know, atheist, communist, hater of the church, couldn't stand anything she said about anything, uh, and really came to the church and to, to understand the, the perspective of the church on life issues specifically. And so it's really a passion of mine to see this kind of information um, get out there. It was the type of stuff that grabbed a hold of me. Um, and, and really convinced me because the, the, tr the truth was what really hooked me. It was the idea that, that nobody was saying what was, what was real about the human person like the, like the church was. And so I'm hoping what I can kind of do with some of this, I don't, I, it's, you know, it's been too long since I've been where you guys are sitting. I don't remember how much you guys know. I'm probably overshooting about half of you and about um, undershooting like crazy the other half of you that are in the pre-med stuff. I'm sorry if it's boring. Um, so I just wanted to kind of get a baseline kind of, of, of what the physiology of the human, rep, you know, the reproductive cycle for a female is like and kind of talk about how hormones, how artificial contraception impacts that and kind of some of the concerns that, that I have in a medical sense about those things, part of the reasons that, uh, you know, I can kind of go into about why 
don't prescribe uh, uh, contraception in my own clinic for contraception reasons. There are other reasons I prescribe hormones, but, but uh, I don't prescribe contraception. Um, so I'm going to start kind of with the basics of the physiology. Sorry, I don't know where I'm supposed to look here. But um, so uh, your, your hormonal cycle starts in the hypothalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus secretes a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone that feeds into the anterior pituitary and uh, the anterior pituitary in turn secretes in a, in a pulsatile fashion two major hormones of, of, the, of the, the hormone cycle, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. They stimulate the follicles to mature in the ovary. And so when you glance down here at the ovary, there's, two, there's kind of three major cells. There are thousands of, of eggs sitting inside every ovary. And they're waiting for this signal to kind of tell which one will become the dominant follicle. And, and the interplay of that's a little bit beyond what I, I need to talk about. But so you've got, you know, these cells and the theca cells on the outside and the granulosa cells on the inside are basically the nurse cells of what will become a, a newly maturing oocyte or egg cell. Um, they, they use the signal of LH, which you can kind of see on the figure up there. Sorry, you should point here. LH and FSH up here to, uh, to build a pathway to take cholesterol uh, and turn it into the, the most common kind of hormones that you see in the system, progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen or estradiol in its, in its different forms. That essentially begins the process of maturation across a whole bunch of different, uh, different ways. And, and really I want to kind of focus on those hormones because those hormones are kind of how contraception is used. Contraception works in the first place. Um, so the estrogen uh, interacts to kind of increase the maturity of these follicles. That, that big gap in the middle there is just a, a bunch of kind of fluid that the nurse cells are secreting. They're, they're kind of just baby in that little cell. There are millions of them that are starting to surround that individual cell and grow and, and in response to the different hormonal cascade. That estrogen really has its effect most, most noticeably early in the cycle after, after the menstrual cycle is, is finished on the endometrium where it will essentially thicken the endometrium and create kind of a robust uh, spiral arterial wall that kind of fills the, the edges there and, and begins the process by which the, the female is able to receive an egg that will land on that, on that endometrium and, and kind of make its home for, for the entirety of a pregnancy. It also has its effect at the cervix, which is the end point of the, of the uterus. Um, and that cervix is built as a kind of a gateway. And one of the cool things about this, one of the things I, I love about kind of the, the way that, that um, natural fertility care works is you get to kind of see the human body in all of its kind of like amazing intricate beauty. Uh, one of my favorite things is these slides. So, you know, I, I deliver babies. We do, I, some of you might be familiar with the ferning test, which we do when a woman comes in and she's maybe ruptured her, her membranes, broke her water. Um, and we, we put this on a slide and we let it dry. And if it has cervical fluid in it, it'll, it'll create these, these beautiful intricate ferns here uh, that you can kind of see. Um, this, same, this same structure occurs on uh, cervical mucus as it is fertile estrogenic mucus. So the estrogen stimulates the glands in the, in the cervix to secrete a mucus that's like this. And it's, what's beautiful and amazing about it is it's structurally, func it's, it's structure and function are spoken to by, by what you're seeing right in front of you. Those pathways become like little microtubules that essentially are, are highways for, for sperm to, to be pulled inward toward the, toward the ova for fertilization. And it exists this way only for a brief period of time. It's, it's only intended to last for a short stretch of the, of the woman's cycle, specifically because there's a safety issue involved in a woman being open, as it were, to the environment. And so you'll see later, when we get to the progesterone dominant side of the, of the cycle, that uh, you know, the female cycle is, is only briefly like this, and then otherwise it's essentially like a, a physiologic blocked valve. Um, so, uh, so here's your kind of like typical menstrual cycle pattern, and what I really want to kind of focus on is like, so we're looking at FSH kind of climbs, LH 
is kind of, it, it, it's a little delayed because of the, the pulsatility of the GNRH. So GNRH pulses slow at first, and it kind of, the beat picks up as, as it gets further in the cycle. And the beat gets, picks up because of the way that estrogen and progesterone kind of interplay. And that's, again, probably beyond where I, I want to get to with a lot of the physiology of a lot of this stuff. But the important part is that the estrogen itself starts to pick up there. And as it picks up, it begins to feed back against FSH more than against LH. And so LH begins to what they call surge. So you get this, uh, this picture right here. Let me, sorry, my slides are a little. There. So right there at the yellow peak there is called the LH surge. And it's a notable point within, within the, the uh, proliferation and, and ovulation cycle of a female. It's actually something we can measure. You can, you can see this on, on like urine sticks is sometimes what we do in, in fertility care. Um, and that LH surge co correlates with the moment right preceding essentially ovulation. Like that will kick off the cascade of events that happens very quickly. And you can see that it's right about mid-cycle. Uh, where that happens. And that's, you know, plus or minus some days and just depends on kind of the, f the female cycle typically. So, uh, so that happens here at, at, um, at, as the, finally the follicle begins to mature and then it, the LH surge causes this rupture right here. And I, I brought in some books, I don't know, Sean, if you don't mind like passing them around a little bit, but um, this guy, uh, Leonard Nielsen, uh, 1970s I want to say, he put these photographs together was one of the first guys to, to really like intimately inter, uh, photograph some of the early events of, of human life. Uh, the photos are, you know, again, it's, a, it's another one of those areas where it, like, it just speaks to uh, the beauty of the human system, the truth of what we're for in, in this process. So this right here is the fallopian tube at the very outlet. And those are the, what they call the fimbriated ends. They are, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it, delicate as a flower is hard to, it's hard to describe just how incredible this process is. And one of the like, I mean, to kind of geek out a little bit about it, uh, um, it one of the coolest things is it's, um, there's, a, there's a chemotactic process, which means it can like, it can use chemical to help attract the egg into it. And one of, the, one of the fascinating parts about that is that if you say lost this ovary, and you've got the other one over here, but you've only got this tube, and uh, you still want to get pregnant. Um, that, this thing, even though it's tied by a suspensory ligament over here to the pelvis, it can chemotactically call the egg forth from the other ovary and pull it in by those little, but it like wafts it by those little ends. And it is, I mean, it's an exquisite process, and it really does, it just reflects like, the, the incredible complication and, and physiology of this system is so, it's, I mean, it's just like, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, it's just incredible to see some of the stuff that, that you know, occurs on a, like an every month basis in this setting. So anyways, take a look at the books. It's got these in it. There's one where the egg is actually like rupturing and getting caught by this. It's, it, I don't know how he did it, but it's amazing. Uh, okay, so anyways. Um, so back to the physiology. So now, so now what's happened is that this follicle right here has ruptured. And what's left is something that, that turns into what they call the corpus luteum. It's, a, it's, a, um, it, it, it's not dead yet. It's, it has a function. It's a hormone secreting organ now. And its job becomes to secrete the hormone of pregnancy until a pregnancy might potentially exist. So progesterone, progestation, the hormone of pregnancy, um, is secreted by this follicle back towards the ovary and through the human system um, by this until if, if the egg implants, then, then it actually secretes a hormone that's essentially bioidentical, uh, HCG, which we know mostly that's the hormone that you test for when you decide, like, hey, am I pregnant? Um, and so... Uh, so it secretes that essentially to, to the same lining here and thickens it even more, makes it even more pillowy. My, my favorite professor of this in, in college always said that the, the estrogen makes the house and the progesterone like puts the drapes up and stuff. 
Um, and so, uh, so fills this out, makes the lining even more receptive, more ready for, for you know, a pregnancy. Progesterone works at the cervix, like I was telling you guys about earlier, to change that, that cervical mucus into a cervical mucus that's, that's a little harder to see on this one, but it's a progesterone dominant mucus. It's essentially a complete blockade. It does not allow anything to come this way. It's a safety issue for females. It keeps them safe from infection. It keeps the baby safe from potential infection uh, throughout the remainder of the month, essentially. Uh, okay, so, um, so that's kind of like the, the, typical the typical cycle. And kind of what I wanted to focus on with birth control is how different that hormonal pathway is. You can kind of see like the, you know, exquisitely complex differences in those different hormones. And then here's kind of what you do with a typical monophasic birth control. So there's lots of different ways you can do birth control. You can do triphasic or, or monophasic. You can do patches or pills. You can go forever. This cycle can last any time you want. But the, fun, the fundamental aspect of it is that what you're doing, what, what the signal of, of okay, we're not, having, we're not having a pregnancy this month, we're not implanting a new, a new baby, is that the progesterone right here at the end, along with the estrogen, drop off dramatically. And that induces this, all this spiral artery stuff and all the, all the stuff that was built to shed. So that's the signal that says, okay, it's time, we're, we're going to let go and then rebuild next month in preparation again. So you can fake that, and that's what you do with pregnancy, is you give seven days, four days, depends on what you want to do, uh, of placebo pills right here. So this is usually iron tablets that are in there. They're colored differently in your little pill packs. Um, don't learn any of this personally. Um, but anyways, uh, so it, it uses a relatively low level of estrogen and a relatively high level of progesterone. And so the ways that it works, it has kind of three core mechanisms that, that it works on. Um, the first is that it undermines or it, it kind of creates this, this feedback inhibition. So estrogen itself and progesterone both, as they are at this kind of level, feedback negatively on the GnRH and on the FSH and LH. So you don't get this follicular progression. Um, so no follicle becomes dominant. You do not ovulate most of the time when you are on a contraceptive pill. Even though you have a typical withdrawal bleed, everything feels normal, you have the kind of cycle that you expect to have, you don't actually have uh, any, of the, any of the ovulatory event that precedes it. Women have lots of anovulatory cycles that they don't know, but not every single one of them like you do on, on this. Uh, the second mechanism is that it thickens this biological valve. It kind of holds it at a constant high level of progesterone so that this valve is constantly a thick mucus. That has physiologic consequences that we'll talk about. Um, and then, um, sorry. Um, and then uh, the last one, and maybe a little bit controversial, uh, not really, but I mean, this we know mechanistically. But this leads into something that is uh, you'll see in the literature, you'll see in criticisms of, of what I'm about to talk about um, as being uh, controversial in terms of its mechanism of, of action. So thinning the endometrium means that this lining is less capable of receiving a, an egg. Um, and I'll get into some of that in a little bit, but needless to say, what it means is that even if you fertilize, which mostly is done in the tube, uh, that it can't land anywhere. It doesn't have anywhere to land. And so you've got a fertilized ovum that essentially just, you know, spontaneously aborts. Um, so, uh, okay. So uh, this is kind of my, like, my schema of what I talk to with most of my patients. This is kind of the core of why I don't prescribe, core of the problems that I have with, with uh, contraception at, at its base. So, uh, you know, and I didn't, I didn't bring in all my citations, so I'm sorry, but, um, but anyways. The, um, the core of it, so first of all, like from a health standpoint, and this goes back to kind of the physiology that I want to kind of think about from the standpoint of which hormones are there. So why do you get acne? Why do you get headaches? Why do you get kind of a weird hair growth sometimes? Well, it's because progestins, not progesterone, are in contraception. So contraception of every variety can't mimic what your body can do, what, what, our, you know, what the females in this room's body can do naturally. We make this artificial stuff from yams, uh, uh, and and it's what's what's weird about it is it's synthetic and it's similar enough. And you saw it kind of in the earlier part of the cascade, from the theca cells to the granulosa cells. It's 
it's pretty bioidentical to testosterone, and so it has, it has testosterone-based effects in the human system. And so lots of, the, lots of the time what you'll hear from providers, what I, I see all the time is women come to me and they're like, oh, you know, I hate that one because it caused, you know, a little bit of like acne or it caused weird hair growth. But it's just, it's another place where it speaks to the kind of the, the, the we cannot mimic human physiology uh, well enough for this to be a, a healthy response. The other stuff is things like nausea, weight gain, breast tenderness that sometimes happen. Usually those are most, mostly estrogen dominant phenomenon, some of them progesterone as well, um, because essentially that high level of estrogen and progesterone is, is physiologic mimic of pregnancy. I mean, think about what it is to spend your, most of your adult female life in a physiologic state that is akin to pregnancy. Um, and how weird that is from a physiologic standpoint that we ask that of, of the females that we're in relationships with. I, I just, it boggles my mind. Uh, there's, uh, we know that it's a stroke risk. We know that it's a heart attack risk. We know that it's a blood clot risk. I do inpatient and outpatient medicine. I do obstetrics. I see this. I have watched a woman stroke from this. It was terrifying. Um, and it's not, I don't want to, you know, like I use lots of medicines that hurt people sometimes. You know, not intentionally, uh, but, <laughs> but, uh, but so I don't want to, I don't want to be a scaremonger here, but, but my, my point is that like, you have to, you know, this, this is the conversation you have every time with your patients when you're sitting in the room. It's do the risks outweigh the benefits. And I, I'll, I'll make an argument kind of at the end that no is the answer, unequivocally no. So other stuff, cancer is, uh, is something, um, you know, it's, it's, not just breast cancer, but really early breast cancers. We see this more commonly. Um, cervical cancer, and we think, sadly, it's probably because the, the, the safe sex practices uh, of, of partners are not there, and so that you're more likely to get cervical cancer from HPV infections. Um, it does reduce risk of ovarian and uterine cancer because of some stuff that happens uh, um, from uh, dominant cycles that are, that are heavy in estrogen um, for reasons I, I don't need to get into. But the point is, those are much rarer cancers anyways. Uh, and so the overall effect is carcinogenic. And then in terms of libido, it's kind of the same thing with, with pregnancy. Um, so beyond health stuff, um, there's a ton of data on mood. This drives me nuts because the, the uh, you know, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the, the general kind of like my body uh, AFP, uh, consistently try to downplay a lot of this stuff, try to, you know, try to whitewash a lot of the problems that are associated with this. There was a Danish study that was done in 2018 that was published in JAMA, thank goodness, um, and, and showed an incredible increase in, in these types of behaviors. Suicide attempts, increase in suicide that, that were actually completed. This was a fascinating study that was in the British Medical Journal that showed a 92% increase in violent death, period that was mostly mediated by suicides and intimate partner violence. And, you know, like, their, their quote was perfect. It was like, we are unable to explain the increased risk of violent and accidental death in our study. And I'll, I'll agree, like, there's no clear, like, oh, of course it's this. But it just speaks to kind of like the, the, the myriad of things that we, it's like the, we don't really know what we're doing here. That's my, that would be my argument. So mood um, attraction is actually kind of a fascinating area of study with, um, with hormonal contraception. Um, this is, they, they did this study where they kind of showed like faces to different women and they, they were, they, they, you said, am I on a pill or am I not? Uh, and they, they consistently chose less masculine partners. They chose worse providers by earnings. So they actually, they were not, they were picking out men who were less good at being stable, healthy providers. They chose less stable uh, relationships. And this is kind of, this is a different thing from a different study. Um, but they, um, so the, the way you smell actually has a lot to do with um, your immune system. Uh, you get about half and half from each parent. Um, and your immune system is mediated largely by this, by a complex they call MHC complexes. And the MHC complexes are, are a detectable odor that we think is sort of like pheromones, right? Uh, and, um, and the way that you, the scents you appreciate tend to actually be a sense that you are, you are histocompatible with the, the HC. 
and they were less likely to pick out a complex that was associated with histocompatibility in the same study when they were on contraception. This one I feel a little bad about. Um, this, this is a, is a study, I, I just want to throw the caveat out here, I'm not endorsing lap dancing. Um, but what I want to highlight with this is this is about how, this is about how humans are able to perceive attraction and, and what attraction looks like. So they, they watched and they, they, they checked the tip earnings of women who were cycling normally versus women who were not cycling normally because they were on hormonal contraception and the women who were not cycling normally were less attractive. I don't know where you interpret all that. I, I feel like some of that is like, is it because women are more interested in guys during cyclic periods or is it because guys are more interested in women during cyclic periods? I, I think it's another one of those like, you know, black boxes, but it's another thing that kind of shows like you, you are mediating changes in the human physiology and in our relationships between, between people that are dramatic and we just pretend that they're nothing. Um, this is kind of my particular wheelhouse. This really grinds me up because it's a, it's a, uh, I'm part of the science, right? Uh, and um, I can't stand how this is represented to everybody, frankly. I listen to fellow providers talk about it and I'm, it boggles my mind. Uh, you'll often hear, I don't know how many women have ever had the discussion about uh, birth control with a provider or how many guys have heard a woman have this, this discussion, but you'll hear the phrasing around it. So the phrasing is, well, if you use contraception, oral contraception with the right way, you will have a 1% chance of getting pregnant. There's two lies in that that are deep, deeply buried and, and mind boggling. Uh, the first is that that's perfect use, which nobody does. I have a clinic full of not perfect use of literally anything. When you survey how people take their, their, their prescribed medicines, most of them take it less than 30% of the time they are taking it as directed, as I write it out. So perfect use is gone. There's nobody that does perfect use. The second piece, so perfect use, is, so like if you look at what typical use looks like, so let's just unpack and say, okay, fine, your provider's good. They say, here's what typical use rate is. It's about 9% the chance that you're gonna get pregnant. What does 9% mean? Has anybody ever asked their doctor what 9% actually means? Well, what they're really saying is, it's 9% per year chance that you're gonna get pregnant. So in a full year of use, you have a 9% chance of getting pregnant. That's, that's just one year. What about the next year? And then the next year? And then the next year? So are you, are you really encountering the idea that there's some 45% chance over a five year span that you're gonna get pregnant? Um, I, the, the piece that bothers me about that is that the failures themselves become the statistic of, well, I was on birth control. Why, you know, it, sh it was supposed to work. So when it fails, when you're in a dramatically bad situation and you were sure, well, where do you turn, you know? And so 48% by Guttmacher Institute, which is a super pro-abortion, pro-whatever, you know, whatever you want to do, uh, organization, th their own stats, 48% of the abortions that are performed are performed on women who were on a contraceptive. And 24% of them were in, or were in the ones that they consider high grade, not just the, you know, like, oh, it's the, I was using a condom or something like that. Um, and then this is the one where I kind of talked, I kind of led or into the idea of like the third mechanism. So this is a little controversial. You'll see both sides argued. Uh, uh, abortifacient means that it has the capacity to abort a, a, a fetus that is forming in the womb by its very mechanism. And so I, I would argue, I don't need to get too deep into it, but what I want to argue is that the idea that it's not is, is on its face absurd. Um, we know that the mechanism is that it alters the lining of the uterus. We know that it fails sometimes. So if you're telling me that it fails sometimes, and you're telling me that it, it occasionally manages to get fertilized in the tube still, then it gets out from the tube, and you're telling me that presumably that this fetus that's now growing inside, inside mom never, never, fails to land on a, on a denuded endometrium because 
because what I, I honestly don't know. What bothers me worse was that when that became kind of a controversy, the American College of Obstet Obstetricians and Gynecologists changed the definition of pregnancy, changed the definition of when you are pregnant to say it's not when you fertilize, it's when the baby lands. And so it's not an abortion because the baby didn't land. So it's not pregnancy. You're not pregnant. You just had a miscarriage. Anyways, okay. This is just fun. Uh, I was reading an article. This, uh, this is totally speculative, but it was kind of interesting. Like the, you know, <laughs> the idea that like fish downstream of some sewage plants are getting like all the hormones that we're putting into the system now and that they're getting boy parts when they're supposed to be getting girl parts or vice versa. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> fun speculation. All right. So uh, briefly, I know you guys are going to talk about it later, but I wanted to kind of just touch on like natural methods. This is kind of what I teach in clinic. It's easier than you think. Um, uh, so um, it's, it's based around the simple fact that physical changes are easily observable. This is, we've, been, we've been doing this for years. Mother Teresa teaches this to, to or taught this to women, uh, to women in India by, you know, like on the street, stretch their mucus. So, um, so it's, it's reliant on some basic facts. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through where those things are, but basal body temperature shifts a degree after that LH surge. Uh, the cervical mucus, we talked about why it changes, and you can actually track those cervical mucus changes, uh, cervical position changes, um, and then the LH surge like I talked about. Here's the, the Marquette method. Um, this is tracking basal body temperature. You check each morning, same kind of time, uh, and you just watch your, your temperature, and the ovulation occurs the day you spike, basically, or the day after you, or the day before you spike. Um, so this is your fertile period, and you kind of begin to track. And I'll show you an app at the end that I use with patients that have no understanding, no desire to engage with the like the full bore version of like natural family planning. That's pretty easy, and most women can use it. This is the cervical mucus again, kind of a little bit better about the like the valve difference between the sperm kind of moving through easily, and then the sperm blockaded here. Um, uh, this is the, the cervical position changes. I don't recommend this. This is like, you shouldn't be checking your own cervix. It's probably not better. Uh, um, LH surge kits, you can check an LH uh, as, you get, uh, as you go through your, your cycle. Um, some women, especially the ones that I see that are trying to get pregnant, that are looking for that fertile window, um, will use these sticks. Um, and then this is the convenience thing. So this is Kindara. Um, I, I seriously recommend most of my patients. You know, I teach the, the natural family planning method through the Creighton model. Um, this integrates some of the Creighton model stuff um, and, uh, and has its own, it's, it's focused around body temperature here, um, the cervical mucus, uh, and then the cervix positioning, if you really got enthusiastic about it. Those are little like when you made love and this is like when you were bleeding. Um, and then this kind of identifies what your days of fertility are. Um, women who track this well are not just, not just better at knowing when they're fertile and when they're not, um, but they're, they, they pick up physiologic things that are changing in them. I see women in, in my clinic, not as often, but, uh, but in like, uh, so Dr. Parker, Dr. Sink, I uh, do this with, uh, with Susie. Um, and they see a lot of the, the more sort of obstetric clientele that are specifically focused around trying to achieve fertility, trying to uh, diagnose problems in, in their fertility and problems in their, you know, in their general menstrual life, in their hormonal life. And it's amazing how much information is contained within here for a provider like me. When I see a chart like this, I, I can pick out a ton of things that can be wrong with a, with a female cycle that, that can go years undiagnosed can be sources of pain, can be sources of misery for women. And it's, uh, it's, it's such a shame that we don't have this kind of perspective because we don't teach any of this stuff um, in a way that allows women to really harness that kind of stuff. Um, this is a more accurate table of like your typical like use rates and your failure rates. You can see that like with Marquette and Billings, you know, like part of the challenge of, of failure rate <laughs> in Marquette, Billings and, and Creighton is that like, <laughs> there are a lot of people who are using Creighton that are trying to get pregnant. Uh, and so, and, and I think too, it's like, you know, the, the most fundamental aspect of this is it's an openness to what God wills in your life. 
um, what what comes is, is, is something you're more prepared for. The NFP families that I have in my clinic, when, when an accident happens, are ready. They're ready, and they love it, and they're excited. And so, um, you know, it comes with consternation. It comes with worry, but, but it's a practice of, of uh, patience and trust building and, and love building between a couple because it's fundamentally open to that, to that capacity that every sexual act has of, of creating a new human life and open in a way that really like embraces it. And so, you know, I, I, I talk about, you know, failure rates sometimes to my patients that I know are really trying to get, you know, trying to avoid pregnancy. But I, I don't know much about what to do with the data. Um, I guess, uh, you know, like that's most of my, my stuff. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to kind of answer. We'll hold questions till okay. the end after uh, and then you can ask questions of the doctors or groups and have some comments. So I'll just stick around. Yeah. And, uh, let's welcome Dr. Hello, I'm Dave O'Connor. I'm from the philosophy department. Uh, I guess I'm charged to talk some about Humanae Vitae. Sean wanted me to talk about it from a natural law point of view, which scares the hell out of me. So I'll, I'll talk about it from whatever point of view I got available to me. Uh, the, uh, I want to start out by mentioning some of my own experience with some of these things as a teacher. So for a quarter century, I taught a big lecture course called Ancient Wisdom and Modern Love. And it was a course I developed because I wanted to do a course that had some specifically Catholic stuff, but I also wanted to use both Plato and Shakespeare. So the course was built around Plato's Symposium, around uh, Shakespeare plays, uh, usually Othello and A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Humanae Vitae. So uh, that, that was the course. That was the course that became uh, my books and the videos of me teaching it are still out there. Now it looks like my younger brother or somebody was teaching. <laughs> but a lot of the things that you were talking about, th those things have all been known for a long time. Of course, the science of it has developed, and so there's a lot more precision in the knowledge. But many of these things have been known for quite a while. Humanae Vitae actually gave some impetus to this. Uh, Pope Paul VI, now St. Paul, uh, uh, toward the end of the document actually charges medical professionals to develop natural methods for the spacing of births, would be his language. And so uh, the push to, these, to the scientific advances well, it got momentum from Humanae Vitae. Humanae Vitae is not an anti-science document. Quite the opposite. It's a strongly go find out the science document. Uh, so be really careful about people who tell you to follow the science when in fact they're following something else. Sometimes you might think that there's something in their own being that's masking them from seeing what the science actually says. They're wearing a condom over their heart. And <laughs> you cannot believe what they say. Uh, uh, what, what the doctor said at the end is really important. He didn't quite put it this way. Doctors lie to you. Young women. Many of your gynecologists lie to you. They do not tell you the truth about how, how hormonal contraception works. And when you query them, they treat you like a deplorable white trash person, if you're white. So don't kid yourself about how countercultural this stuff is. You're way, way countercultural to what people with elite educations want to think about contraception and about sexuality. You're in a little bit of a bubble in this particular group, but uh, that bubble 
is not very large and it's very permeable. It breaks easily. It will be hard to live out a countercultural life. Harder once you leave Notre Dame than it is inside Notre Dame, and I don't say it's always easy here. So I wanted to start from that because that is a part of the document, Humanae Vitae, the call to medical professionals who have answered that call. We heard somebody answering it here this very evening to provide the real evidence to people, not Catholics, to people who would live an authentic sexual life. Don't be fooled by people who lie you into compliance with things you know not to be true in your heart. I think that reminder is more important now after these last two years than it has been in my entire career as a teacher. Humanae Vitae got received uh, very negatively before it was ever read. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, stars of Catholic academic theology, those are small stars, I admit, but they're stars in every profession. Uh, they had already organized a large-scale propaganda campaign about Humanae Vitae so that they could spring it in the New York Times on the very day that it was published. Okay, so uh, this, this was not open inquiry, the life of the mind. This was the life of the progressive activist. That's what it was. So Humanae Vitae didn't have a chance as a propaganda document. It's an encyclical. So let me say something about that. When you read Humanae Vitae, there are a few passages where your heart may leap in your bosom and you think, this is a message for my life. But not many. <laughs> right? That's not what it's written for. Right? It's written as a quasi-juridical document. It's an official teaching of the church. That's what Humanae Vitae is. And so, you might say the pastoral rhetoric of Humanae Vitae is underdeveloped. There's some of it in there because the, the Pope had a deep pastoral feeling. But it's primarily an attempt to clarify and simply to restate a deep and long Catholic moral teaching. I hesitate to say a tradition. That makes it look like what, what color of plates you use at Easter or something. Uh, it's a tradition only in the technical theological sense of something that is deep in the heart of the life of the church and that we keep going back to and trying to articulate for contemporary audiences over and over and over again. So, Humanae Vitae shouldn't be understood primarily through the filter of how effective it is as a pastoral document. It's how clear and truth-telling it is as a juridical document. That's its fundamental accomplishment. The pastoral elaboration of Humanae Vitae really stopped dead in July of 1968 when it came out and didn't restart again until John Paul II became Pope. And it's John Paul II's Theology of the Body, which he started to develop uh, and uh, promulgate in the late 70s, that really changed the atmosphere of Catholic thinking about contraception. What's the central thing? Here's the central thing. Humanae Vitae is not about what Catholics can do that Protestants could only do with condoms and with the pill. Because Humanae Vitae is primarily about marriage. It's not primarily about sex. In fact, what in the heck kind of word is sex? 
Sex doesn't even sound like something you want, right? Sexual intercourse. Jeez. Oh, oh, fuck, I got to get to the gym for some sexual intercourse today. Right? It's not the word of somebody in love. I, I, I don't know if any of you are married, but so here's some advice. Uh, on your wedding night, do not ask your spouse, would you like to have sexual intercourse now? <laughs> now that, that phrase is from the public health part of the English vocabulary. That's where it came from. Its first appearance in English is in Thomas Malthus, who wrote a famous essay on population in 1792. That's where it comes from. So if you're in love, stop using it. Figure out what you wanted to say. <laughs> now, if you expect a juridical document issued by the Pope to reiterate with greatest clarity and precision the teaching of the church in a compact form, if you expect it to have the pastoral richness and warmth of great love poetry, you're asking a lot of the Pope, <laughs> right? But, but, people my age, we're incredibly lucky because we got two popes in a row like that. Both John Paul II and Pope Benedict were uh, two of, if you made a short list of the 400 and some popes and you had the top five intellectuals, those two popes would both make it. And they were back to back. And I'm an intellectual, right? <laughs> right? Jesus Christ himself reached down and touched me and said, here you go, I'm giving you two. Right? It's incredible. So, Humane Vitae, as a papal document, it's ridiculous to expect it to have the immediate pastoral engagement that then John Paul II was able to provide with his theology of the body. Even then, even then, John Paul II's own natural vocabulary was a vocabulary that came from Central European philosophy. And it was often quite technical. Now, if you've read any of uh, what he wrote about the nuptial meaning of the body, uh, his reflections on Genesis. They're beautiful writings, but they're also hard. And if you look in the footnotes, he has footnotes to academic philosophers in there. Right. So, uh, to, to make Humane Vitae, so to speak, come alive as a voice to you, if you happen to be somebody whose life is often organized through intellectual powers, that's great. You'll be able to use Humanae Vitae, especially with what John Paul II and to some extent Pope Benedict were able to do with it. But don't worry. To be a Catholic, you don't have to be a theologian. In fact, there's some evidence those two things don't help very much. Right? So Humanae Vitae is very poorly understood if it's read and decontextualized, so it's primarily about the sexual act. <clears throat> at, at least it's better to call it the conjugal act. Nobody knows what you're talking about, but it sounds sort of interesting, <laughs> right? So, so uh, it, it's about the conjugal act because it's about marriage, right? And it turns out that having a lifelong sexual relationship somebody with somebody is at the core of being married to that somebody. And everything that's in the marriage vows is, reaches completion of statement in the loving acts of the conjugal embrace in a married couple. And that's where you all came from. Right? That's how you got here. So the problem that Pope Paul was looking at was that it seemed like people were losing track 
of marriage. It's not that they were losing track of their genitalia. I mean, they follow you around pretty much wherever you go, right? They were losing track of marriage. They were losing the ability to see that when they found another person attractive, what they wanted wasn't to have sex with them. What they wanted to do was to be a person who could give themselves in marriage with them and to receive that other self in marriage. And that's what Humanae Vitae is about. And it just so turns out that human beings have bodies. Not have bodies in the way they have cars. They are embodied. We're animated bodies. We're ensouled bodies. We're incarnate. And so we express and experience the intimacy of married love with our bodies, which includes as the pinnacle of that expression the sexual joining and the enjoyment of the specific intimate and unique pleasures of that sexual joining. Humanae Vitae's core moment is a short passage called Characteristics of Conjugal Love. And Paul VI famously listed them. One, as he said, love is human and therefore of the senses and spirit. That is, it's incarnational. It's the fact that your body is not a machine for you. Your body is what expresses you. Your body is how your soul manifests itself in this world. By the way, after you die, maybe a little practice in purgatory and you're in heaven, uh, the end of the world, you'll get your body back, there'll be the resurrection of the body. So if you want to get really theological and go in that direction, this is very deeply integrated into Catholic theology. It's very deeply integrated into Marian theology, too. Think about the importance of the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception. Both of those central Marian doctrines are themselves incarnational doctrines. So the first point is that love is human, therefore of the body and the spirit. And so what it is when you find somebody attractive is that very special aspect of your powers starts to open up. The aspect of your powers that makes it possible for you to become a spouse. So it's a great thing to find somebody sexually attractive as long as you don't, out of fear or dishonesty, derail that experience. Because that experience surely does not issue uh, in uh, what a desire for mere bodily sexual release? No. It makes you want to be with that person. And over time, to grow in commitment and honesty, and honesty so that the fullest expression of that interest in another person could really be an act of conjugal union. But of course, until you make the commitments of marriage, the act of uh, pseudo-conjugal union doesn't tell the truth about what your relationship really is. That act can tell its truth, can speak, well, can say truthfully what it most wants to say, only within the bonds of the marriage, for better, for worse, till death. So the second point that the Pope made is that love is total that it's a very special form of friendship. I'm not even happy with the word friendship there. Because while I'm certainly friendly with my wife, my wife is not my friend. I don't sleep with any of my friends. <laughs> uh, you know, I hear students say, I've been hearing students say this a long time, uh, They'll say things like, well, yeah, you should be friends first, right? No, God, 
I was never my wife's friend. First time I saw her, I, uh, saw her, I thought, wow, that, uh, she's a very attractive woman. <laughs> now, fortunately, I still think that, right? Now, I work at that because that's part of being married, is to continue to find your spouse a conjugal partner with all the totality and intimacy and uniqueness that that brings. So, of course, you're friendly with the person you fall in love with and ultimately with the person who becomes your spouse. But I'm very skeptical that the best way for people your age to find a spouse is to have a social group undifferentiated of male and female friends. I think that's not the right place. I think there's something unnatural about that. I don't mind if you have buddies of the opposite sex, but you'll notice that it's very dislocating of a social circle where two of the buddies start to date each other. Right? They're different relationships. So be careful about flattening out the specific energy of ascent that erotic attraction brings into your life by being satisfied with the comfortableness of supportive friendship. Of course, that more vertical ascending power of Eros and that more horizontal comforting power of friendship, those are both part of a real marriage and of a real family. But it won't do to judge the energies of Eros simply by the comforts of friendship. I think that that's a, a fundamental mistake that came into our culture at about the same time that it became a standard assumption in elite circles that every young woman between 16 and 45 would be sterilized. That makes it possible for men and women to see each other in a very flattened way. Because when they see each other, something is missing. What's that something? Well, it turns out the Pope mentioned that too. He said that conjugal love is fruitful. It's, it's a simple idea. Some of you probably already learned that. Uh, it, it turns out that the physical expression of the greatest intimacy that one can achieve makes babies. It's fruitful. So that, to use the formula, marital love, conjugal love, expressed sexually, is both unitive and procreative. Not because there are two things. Well, on the one hand it's unitive, and on the other hand it's procreative but because it's a very particular kind of union. This is part of why I push against the friendship model. It's a special kind of union because it's the union in procreativity. Every single one of you as an individual is sterile. Every single one. And is the Virgin Mary here? If she's not, every single one of you, okay? But probably every single couple here between a male and a woman, a, a man and a woman, is fertile. Fertility is something you only have in couples. This is why when you get married, a new thing exists in the world. Call that the metaphysics of marriage. A new thing exists in the world. And that thing can make a child. And you've, those of you who've become a couple with someone, uh, though I doubt you've already had a child, you probably have experienced the way that people treat you somewhat differently when you're a couple. And you'll notice that you talk differently. Your personality changes a little bit when you're part of that couple. That's not a bad thing. That's not some erasure of your individuality. That's your discovery of your coupleality. Right? That's what you're becoming. 
That's why young people who get married often find, rather to their disappointment, that they, they can't socialize on as easy a terms as they used to with their single friends. Because they're a different thing now. And then once you have a baby, it's really terrible. Uh, there's very few people as boring as new parents. <laughs> right? uh, so they hang out with other people. Not, it's not, they hang out with other people who have babies, not because they care about the other people's babies, but they give each other a chance to glory in their babies. These are a perfectly natural human, parts of the human growth into the incredible power of becoming a spousal couple and how different that is from other aspects of human life. So I would say about humane vitae, don't worry so much about understanding humane vitae as a part of the long history of Catholic development of the natural law. Uh, it's true it is that, and there is real theological and philosophical value in understanding that. But primarily it is, to use language closer to John Paul II's, but still quite technical, it's a phenomenology of the, the spousal experience. It's an account of what we learn by really making ourselves a fully giving and receiving spouse both giving and receiving. You can't be a good sexual partner, as we say. It sounds like you started a business firm, right? You can't be a good sexual partner unless the intimacy of both giving and receiving, the special pleasure with its special vertical dimension of meaning, unless that's a part of your life. It is hard to be married to somebody who can't receive. I don't mean just sexually, though sexual is a part of married life. Right? Uh, fortunately, I was not trying to be married to my dad because you could not give him a gift. Right? It was absolutely impossible. Uh, like at Christmas time when we were kids, he'd give us money and, and say, go buy something for your mother. And if you bought something for him, it was like, oh God. Right? He's a terrible gift receiver. He's a good gift giver. I'm happy with that. But uh, he, he could not receive gifts from his children graciously. He could not do that. So an essential part of the marital relationship is also the ability to receive graciously, not just the ability to give generously. So you, you have lots to learn, believe me. And you'll, you'll screw up. I mean, everybody I've known who ever got married does. But don't screw up this, that you have a unique power, and it is the power most closely associated with God's creative power. In the beginning, he created the male and female. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, two from one. That is the deepest aspect of humane vitae, is the reminder, a reminder that should fill us with joy, but of course, a joy that goes with a certain amount of awe, and that means an admixture of fear about our ability to become spouses. You don't all have to become spouses. Some of you will find another vocation. But for most of us, the thing that most raises us into the image of the divine will be our life as a spouse. And that will include our lives as parents, something none of us will become all by ourselves. Thank you. All right, we'll have a few minutes for questions. Um, you raise your hand, I'll come to you, and uh, you can ask a question of either speaker or both. It's hard stuff. <laughs> Any questions? First, like Steve. If you can, yeah. For Professor O'Connor.
So what are your thoughts on the Gen Z and millennial dating culture, especially as it pertains to Notre Dame? And how have you noticed I never date you? anybody from Gen Z. <laughs> The, uh, you know, I, I look around the room, I see a lot of prospects, uh, brunettes, redheads, blondes, and I haven't even mentioned the women yet, R right? All kinds of possible. Uh, no. So, the, uh, I think that the, uh, the atmosphere around, it's not just around elite culture, but in a way it's most visible there, is extremely acidic. Uh, I, I think you have to make a really conscious effort to be countercultural to find what your heart really wanted. And uh, this isn't a personal comment, so this is a general comment. The, in, a, uh, in a dating culture where to ask for or to accept a date is to make a sexual proposition already, it's extremely difficult for men and women to find each other. So it used to be that uh, older adults created social contexts where young people could meet each other, express romantic interest, but also be able to save face if those overtures were declined. So it wasn't all on you. All of those mediating structures have fallen into the past, as far as I can tell. There's very little of that. Notre Dame has a career center. They don't have a nuptial center. Uh, and is that because we think your career will be more important than your married life? Or is it just that we would be embarrassed to think that one of the things that a, uh, a bright young person of your age might seek at college were people you might marry and fall in love with? I mean, that seems like a great reason to go to college to me. Now, nobody would go to college just for that. Hmm? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's too slow and too much work. There are other ways to do that, right? But uh, it's, it's like to, to say, to mention that people between roughly 18 and 22, uh, or graduate students on the younger end of that sometimes twilight trail, uh, that they are at a time of life and a time in their own maturation where they have a special talent for falling in love. And they do. Just like when you got here as a first year student, some of you may be first year students, you probably made, I don't know, a couple of hundred friends the first week. And Every year you drop some of them off. <laughs> and then by the time you graduate, you think, you know, this is the, my core, my core friendship group. It's this six people. And then two years after college, there's one of them you still talk to. Luckily, you have social media, so you can pretend. <laughs> right? But your, your real core relationships are more limited than that. And you have, at, at your age, you have an easier time meeting new people and enjoying them than people our age do. <laughs> We're actually only a year apart. <laughs> it was a really hard year, though. <laughs> so, uh, don't squander this time of life. This is a privileged time of life to fall in love. Don't squander it. And I, I can't do anything unless I started the nuptial center. <laughs> we, 
<laughs> How much would you pay to be part of the Nuptial Center? Right? So, uh, we'll be talking later. We'll start the sign up list. But, uh, you know, we, we don't have that. And I think that uh, young people have to have their own subcultures, as, as difficult as that is. The, uh, the emotional load of approaching someone because you're interested in them, you find them attractive. If what that means is, I want to have sex with you within a week, well, that's a terrible place to live, and it's not your fault that that's how crazy the place you live is. But if you don't want it, I don't see your parents giving you any help, or your grandparents. They're not creating that mediated space where you can find each other. The other thing I would tell you to do is get married younger. And if, if, look, if the Catholic Church is going to tell you don't have sex until you're married, and Notre Dame, the $20 billion Catholic Church, <laughs> is in effect going to tell you don't get married until you've made partner, well, they're lying to you. <laughs> Those are inconsistent messages. Right? That you can't live that way. So you've got to decide which is more important. And I, I'll tell you, I, the, when you hold a baby in your arms that's yours, you'll know which one was more important. I, very few people, when they get promoted to partner, hold their brother partners in their arms. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think that you live in a terribly disordered world. And I think that, alas, the pressure for finding order is going to be on you. I, I think that's very unfair. Uh, I, I blame my generation and the two generations before me, uh, but I, I don't see I don't see a path out that isn't the path you build. Other questions? You can also flee in fear. <laughs> This is a question for um, both of you, but what would you say if you had to give one or two things, and you each give very thorough presentations, so one or two things is asking a lot. Um, one or two things that you think are most important um, to say when you're talking to someone who doesn't, um, who ascribes to, say, the contraceptive mindset, or is anti-abortion but pro-contraception, and kind of that sphere um, and I would say, like, oh, like, what is it for, like, a Catholic or a non-Catholic? But that's too many subdivisions, so mm -hmm. pick one, I guess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, where would you start them? I mean, I'll, I, I start them where I started. It's, it's biased, but uh, the, the truth will set you free. It's, it's the truth. It's obvious. It, we, our bodies are written this way. It's inescapable. Um, and if you just pay attention, it's hard to miss. Um, you know, I'd echo the same thing about the structures all around us have, have crumbled that allowed us to see that fact. Um, every instance of, of love in a, in a sitcom that I turn on is sexual within minutes, let alone, you know, hours. Nobody even has the language to speak of of what we speak about here. And so you're so many degrees of separation from what a, <laughs> what a healthy conversation looks like that it's hard to reach through that. Uh, I, I deal with that every day in my clinic. Um, I deal with that with women who have no conception of what their normal cycle looks like. I, I just can't say enough about what natural looks like and how much healthier it looks across a wide spectrum. And I love watching, honestly. I mean, I, Safety Net Clinic means I have a lot of very, very mm. poor patients, a lot of people on the south side of town who don't have a lot of education, who don't have a lot of the tools that were ever taught to them about how to manage their own fertility. And those people 
often know better than the smartest people I meet about the natural way of their body and honoring that. And it's cool when I get to integrate what I know from, the, from all of the stuff I've spent years, years learning and watch some of those people just intuitively get it. And I tell you what, like the longer you hammer it, the more, the more you just see it as like it's, your, your body speaks the truth. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I think one thing I would, uh, I, I'd look for a way uh, to open a conversation to Ward. Uh, ever since the pill became available around 1960, so we're, we're 60 years into the most extraordinary social experiment in the history of the world. There's never been anything like it. Uh, far more important, it's like the invention of fire in how much it changes the structure of human life. And so uh, the, the burden of this uh, social change and of articulating it has fallen almost entirely on women because it somehow has both uh, made it uh, inappropriate for men to have an opinion on whether the women they, they are attracted to, they'd like to get pregnant. That's actually a really sexy thing to want to get pregnant with somebody. Uh, it, it's like you're supposed to forget that somehow. Uh, but it's given men a, an easy default into silence. And uh, there is no progress to be had if contraception is a women's issue. Uh, women are all sterile until they start to consort with men. It's a couple's issue. There is no conversation that's sustainable that isn't a conversation with couples. This is one reason that natural family planning is is often promulgated more couple to couple than it is just as an individual choice. And there, there's, there's something really right about that. So reorganizing conversation around couples as opposed to individuals as if the, uh, they're sexually active, kind of like being radioactive, you know? like. <laughs> particles are flying from you somewhere. Uh, th th that is a fundamental change. So that addressing someone either as a member of a couple or as somebody with the power to couple with that nuptial meaning of their body and of, co of course of their spirit. I, I think that's the only road to progress. I think that ultimately is the primary road to progress in the right to life cause as well, but uh, that's a longer conversation about how this couple-oriented and marriage-oriented approach interacts with the, the urgencies of resisting abortion. Uh, a lot of hard questions about that, about how, which conversation do you need at a particular moment. Awesome. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I think we'll just end it here. Next Thursday, we have Natural Family Planning, Catholic Contraception, question mark, which will be with uh, Susan. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, please don't come to hear the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, in fact, no. Uh, that will be with Father Terry and uh, Susie Younger. There will also be food there. Um, and then at the end of this event, Malo is selling tickets to our formal, so please grab them from her. And also come to at the talk next week if you want to grab more tickets. <laughs> no. But um, <laughs> yeah. uh, please give a, if you have any more questions, uh, I'm sure speakers would be uh, more than gracious to answer any ones privately up here. And uh, please give one last final applause for them.